Hello, good afternoon, evening, in fact, to Benjamin Moll. Hi, good afternoon. Joining us from London, if I were a serious YouTuber, I would say, but um, today it's going to be a bit uh, professional, even if there is a political side to the issue as usual, but there is always a political side. Let me say a few words in Italian to our listener. Ciao a tutti, fate i bravi, mettete i like uh, su Facebook, fate spammare. Ben Moll, Benjamin Moll, è un professore di economia, grazie a lui, più giovane del vecchietto, a uh, London School of Economics. I believe he has a PhD from Chicago, right? That's right. Uh, di circa 10-12 anni fa, was 2009, no, 10? No, 2010. 10. Yeah. Who was, yeah. if, I, if you don't mind, who was your advisor? Uh, Bob Lucas, Fernando Alvarez, and Paco Guerra, your colleague, actually. Paco, so I should call Paco to come and say hi. I was no, just right. talking to him. He was just, we were just talking about a book he was reading with nice data. Right. All right. So his advisor, his suoi direttori tesi sono il buon Bob Lucas, di cui avete sentito parlare svariate volte. <clears throat> Fernando Alvarez, di cui avete sentito parlare meno, ma un bravo ragazzo argentino. E un altro collega argentino che era al tempo a Chicago, adesso è qua con me e con cui infatti ero cinque minuti fa, che si chiama Francisco Paco Buera, da cui the fact that I call Bergoglio Paco. Uh, and now, uh, the reason we have been here today, and now we switch to English, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Be good. Don't ask questions for the first 20 minutes, half hour, then ask questions, because I am not going to pay attention to you for the first half hour. I have to pay attention to our guest. Um, So uh, Ben wrote a paper, interesting, controversial, managed to get uh, some ministers in his country, he's from of German origins, somewhat nervous. Uh, <laughs> so they said things, that's okay, that's what politicians do, they say things. The paper is joined with eight others, so it's a team of nine, I think it's a record in economics, I don't remember any team in our mm -hmm. areas, right? I don't remember a paper in macro with nine guys. Four, so, I think I can yeah. push to five, but nine. That's, yeah, that's because it's not a paper in one field. It's sort of cutting across. It goes, fields. cuts across. Yeah, different there's, expertise, exactly. There is energy. There's a lot of things. So what yeah. they did, I'm going to show you in case you're curious, you can get the details. I already put the link in the description for Facebook for those that are here on um on Twitch, and then we'll watch this video on YouTube when I post it. Uh, I will put references to their paper and their work uh, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the description. But uh, for now, here it is. And just to give credits to uh, bank orders, this is the team. Dudiger Bachmann, correct me if I pronounce the last name wrong. Okay. David Bakke, Bakke, Christian Bayer. I don't even know how to pronounce that properly myself, David. Oh, well, excellent. I feel much better now. <laughs> oh, he's, uh, he's a UCLA. All right. Looks at that. Christian Bayer, uh, Bonn. Moritz Kuhn, Bonn. Andreas Löschel, uh, Bochum. Ben Moll is the person here with us. Andreas Peichel, uh, Munich. Karen Pittel, uh, where is she? Munich. Yeah. And Moritz Schuller. Schuller. There you go. Bond. Awesome. Yeah, there's a lot All of right. bond. Lots of bond. And so, as you see, most of them are back home. So, what's the contention of the paper? What's the bottom line of the paper, Ben? <laughs> the bottom line of the paper is um, that, so, so the question, obviously, is, you know, what were to happen to the German economy if we did a um, full sort of cold turkey um, import stop of uh, all of Russian oil, uh, gas, and coal, And the bottom line is um, that, you know, it'd be bad for the economy, but not the end of the world. So we come up with a headline number, which is uh, half a percent best case scenario to worst case three percentage point of GDP loss. Um, for comparison, the COVID crisis in Germany was four and a half percent GDP loss. So it'd be slightly less bad than the COVID crisis. Um, obviously, very unevenly distributed, in particular, across sectors. So some sectors would be you know, very hard hit. Um, so say the chemicals industry or something like this. Um, some others, not so much. Um, 
But again, so that's sort of similar to the COVID crisis where some sectors were uh, uh, hit very hard. And so we think, you know, it's it. we shouldn't take it off the table, basically, is I guess the, the bottom line. And in particular, um, before we wrote the paper, a bunch of politicians would go on air and say things like, if we do this import stop, it would lead to mass poverty um, uh, and unemployment. Um, and I guess, which sort of sounds maybe like the Great Depression. And I guess we're saying, no, look, guys, like this, that's, that's too extreme. Um, it would lead to a, a sizable recession. You know, 3% isn't nothing, um, but uh, it's not the end of the world either. And uh, Germany is a rich country. Um, we have the fiscal capacity um, to take extra debt, and we could sort of compensate the people and firms um, who would lose. So, you know, in principle, it's doable. Whether you want to do it in the end, you know, that's a separate matter. That's a political decision, um, which we economists, you know, can't make. Um, that's for the politicians to make. But, you know, just and it, it depends on lots of other things. Like, you know, what do you think are the benefits of this um, in terms of uh, affecting the war, say, um, all sorts of political economy issues. Um, uh, but, you know, just in terms of the economic costs to the aggregate economy, mostly, um, and, you know, how that's distributed across the population, we think in principle, one could, uh, you know, deal with it, basically. So, uh, to be precise, what you guys consider, your argument is uh, the total energy consumption or energy inputs uh, that the German economy uses, uh, about 30% of that is Russian stuff. Yeah. And so your exercise is what happens if you uh, cut down about 30% of the imports and go look for substitute and get uh, to handle the relative uh, price increases and so on. So it is a, yeah. well, let's go with question in order. First, just clarification. That includes coal, gas, and oil. That's right. Yeah, those are the primary energy sources that uh, Germany imports from Russia. Um, and um, there's a table, maybe if we can look at that um, in the in this Vox EU column that you had already showed, that yeah. has the total energy consumption for uh, different energy sources and shows how much of that comes from Russia, where you can sort of see it uh, quite nicely. Yeah, um, they are. Yeah, they actually amplify yeah. them a bit. Yeah, there you go. Boom. Um, <clears throat> so exactly. So the uh, the first the, the so relevant this is the total use for types, and then we have the Russia. Right. Exactly. So this is in terawatt hours, which is, you know, one of these units of energy uh, consumption. Um, and you can see that uh, so, so the left three columns are the most relevant. So oil, gas and coal. Um, the other ones um, are not that relevant because none of that energy is from Russia. Um, but um, if you look at oil, gas and coal, um, you see, for example, that there's say a thousand terawatt hours of oil um uh, energy consumption um which is 31 percent of total energy and 34 percent of that 31 percent say is from russia whereas for gas say um you know it's 905 terawatt hours so roughly a thousand and of that uh uh 55 percent are from russia so these are large numbers right i mean these are big numbers yeah yeah 55 percent of all german gas is from russia i mean and that's why people are scared. I mean, it's, it's you know, it kind of, you know, it, it makes sense. It's not like we're saying these, these are small numbers. Um, and so then basically what we did, um, or rather what um, our energy economist colleagues uh, did is, uh, you know, they had to think um, how much of that can you uh, uh, substitute from other countries? You know, say if that uh, oil uh, from Russia, which again, I, if I remember correctly, now was 30% of all oil consumption, something like this, is from Russia. If that falls away, how much can you substitute? If the coal from Russia falls away, how much can you substitute? And if the gas from Russia falls away, how much can you substitute? And essentially what our energy economists tell us is that um, the problem is gas, okay? So for oil and coal, um, because these are commodities that you can ship, um, it's, uh, and there's sort of a global market for them, you can, uh, you know, get this from other countries. You, you're going to have to pay higher prices, but, you know, in at least in principle, you can get these from other countries. Well, one question. When they try to estimate the higher prices that would come from that, yeah. are they assuming only Germany moves away from Russia or, say, yeah. Italy does as well and all everybody else does? I mean, no, or so at least all the countries that are currently 
uh, joining yeah. in the embargo? Yeah. No, that's a good question. So yeah, we, for the purpose of this exercise, assume that only Germany uh, uh, tries to substitute. Yeah, which then, if you if you if you think about an EU-wide embargo, that's probably a bad assumption. And then for uh, uh, oil and coal, and what do they assume? Because there is obviously a problem how much the the, the oil in particular. We know there is plenty of untapped uh, yeah. ability to 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 pipe to to to, yeah. to pump up oil from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and other. So that depends a lot on political yeah. choices. But actually, I mean, let me put the focus slightly somewhere else. So what we yeah. really did is we then kind of focused on gas. Like the paper is really a paper about gas mostly. Okay. And in particular, because, because it's gas, the one with rigid, uh, the rigid uh, yeah, market. So the yeah. problem with gas, right, is that it comes by pipeline from Russia. There's literally like the pipeline that, you know, runs from Russia uh, to Germany and it ends, you know, straight in Germany, kind of next to, say, the, the electricity uh, uh, generation plant. Um, and uh, th so the problem is, you know, the gas you cannot put on a ship, or most of it you cannot put on a ship. The only type of gas you can put on a ship is this liquefied natural gas, LNG. Um, and uh, there isn't that much of that to go around in the world. Um, so, uh, uh, and then the other only pipelines you have are basically to Norway. Um, and uh, essentially then the gas you just cannot substitute. And so what our energy economists tell us basically, so 55% of the gas comes from Russia. They reckon sort of optimistically, we can maybe substitute 25% of that 55%, but then basically you still have a 30% gas shortage. So relative to the current gas consumption, gas would drop by 30 percentage points. And so then really, you know, essentially the entire paper is about What's the effect of that 30% drop in gas on the German economy? How bad would that be? And we didn't really uh, flesh out that much, you know, the effect of uh, uh, oil and coal um, and, you know, the, the, the price effects. We talk about this a little bit, but the sort of hard numbers, they're essentially entirely about the, about the effect of the gas shortfall. All right. Um, so what is it you guys, uh, how do you model uh the intersectoral thing because obviously gas goes off fine but then gas is using certain activities and not others so while from the strictly uh, energetic or ecological point of view you can try to say well you know a ton of coal is equivalent to many cubic meters of gas in terms of uh, uh that's not the same thing depending on the plants you have. Some plants are built to receive energy input from gas. Some other are built to get to get energy input from renewables or electric yeah. and so on. And so that's one of the problems. The shock would be very asymmetric or very differentiated. It would be sectors, activities, household and um, business that will resent yeah. only the price effect. Other yeah. will have a strict capital value effect, you know, my capital, uh, my equipment is worth a lot less if I cannot get access to yeah. the gas. Yeah, no, that's right. So the, the main worry um, um, in the German public debate, or I think public debate everywhere that we kind of wanted to speak to is this sort of propagation of the shock through production chains, right? So the, uh, right. in particular in industrial production. So the, the story we heard a lot and we wanted to think about hard was, um, you know, gas is used in particular very heavily, say, in the chemicals industry. So there's a big a German chemical company, BASF, uh, which uh, uses a lot of gas for all sorts of things, for example, to produce plastics, say. Um, and then um, that's sort of a plastic is used for other products, um, say, for food packaging. Um, and then because the food packaging uh, uh, would be affected, then, you know, so, so, so some of the stories we heard were, for example, then, you know, you can't produce food packaging anymore, then there wouldn't be food in the supermarkets, and then, you know, people wouldn't have anything to eat. So that would be like the extreme uh, worst case scenario. But there's lots of other sort of production chains like this, you can tell. Um, and so, yeah, what we did essentially is we took um, a model that exists in the economic literature, which is uh, uh, called the Bakai Fari multi-sector model. So that's why... Um, this guy, David Bakai, is on the paper. He's sort of an expert in these uh, multi-sector models and these production chains. 
which is exactly one of these models that's designed to speak to these kind of issues. So essentially, um, the way these models work is um, there, there's many sectors. So in this case, there's uh, 30 sectors, I think. Um, one of them, for example, being the chemicals industry. And then uh, you have data from what's called uh, input-output tables. Uh, uh, in particular, in this case, there's something called the World Input-Output Database, where you see you know, how much each industry buys from each other industry and from each other country. And so therefore you can, for example, see how much gas does the chemicals industry buy um, uh, from uh, Germany and how much from Russia. And then you can see how much does the food packaging industry buy from the chemicals industry. And you can see, say, how much does the car uh, manufacturing industry buy from the steel industry and how much does the steel industry buy from, um, I, again, again, the chemicals industry and so on. So, uh, and, and then basically you use a model like this um, to, and, and you feed in the shock and you sort of see how it, how it propagates essentially. Does okay. And um, that, yeah, that, well, that makes sense. Then there is a second aspect uh, uh, that uh, just building up progressively um, before we go to the fiscal and more macro thing, let's stay in the intersector technology. Obviously, one of the things we learned in the 70s, its uh, I spent some time in the past uh, working on this as well, it's quite remarkable the way in which technology reacted to the shock. There it was generalized, and once it became clear it was very permanent. For a while, people believed that the first oil shock was just a temporary uh, wow. strange thing. So OPEC then ev eventually reality uh, settled in, and when the second came, people said, oh, wow. Yeah. This is not only staying, this is actually worse. Um, and then the reaction, the technological adjustment reaction was yes. relatively uh, impressive. Some countries didn't realize that Italy is actually one of those, but that's another topic. Um, um, how do you guys do on that? That is, yeah. which ability do you actually honestly have? Because my yeah. own impression is having worked a bit on those matters that our ability to forecast uh, technological adaptation, substitution, change, yeah. uh, shifting of production lines on is extremely weak. Yeah. How do you do on that line? That obviously does not impact the first six months a year. That's something yeah. that you see a year or two after. But this yeah. is a long run game with Russia. So yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Great question. So let me actually take take a little bit of a step back and um, sort of All right. in perspective exactly to say, you know, why, what you assume, how much sort of uh, substitution or uh, adaptability there is matters a lot. Okay. So essentially, so the, so the key thing to start with is that um, gas, um, if you just look at total gas expenditure, it's a relatively small share of the total economic pie. So if you look at just total gas expenditure relative to GDP, um, that's something like one percentage point, okay? So it's small. And so that one percentage point falls by, by uh, 30 percentage points, okay? Um, and so the question is, what's the um, effect of that on the total economy, okay? So just to you know put things into perspective, let me first tell you um, sort of two, I wanna say crazy calculations that you don't wanna do, okay? And then I'll tell you, and those are going to be the two extremes. And then I'm going to tell you, you're, you're going to be somewhere in between. Okay, here are the two crazy uh, calculations you don't want to do. The first crazy calculation, um, which would be way too optimistic, would give you way too positive um, or, or small GDP losses, would be you just take the one percentage point and you multiply it by 30 percentage points. So you would say, okay, 1% of the total economic pie falls by 30%. So that's 1% times 30%, that's 0.3%. And that's, you know, the end of it. That's the, that's the uh, uh, you know, uh, the extent of the damage. The problem with that is exactly it ignores that sort of gas is sort of a critical input in production and, and, and these sort of production cascade type effects, okay? Um, there's another crazy calculation. So, so the numbers should be larger than this, you think, okay? There's another crazy calculation which you don't want to do, okay? which is um, uh, you think there's no substitution whatsoever. Gas is like a total bottleneck in all production processes. And then, then whatever are the inputs in other industries are also the total bottlenecks. And if you have that view, then you'd have the view that uh, if uh, this critical input falls by 30 percentage points, 
regardless of whether it's only you know one percent of the total economic pie it would mean that total gdp total production would fall by 30 percentage points so uh you know yeah. total production would fall one for one with the critical input right so uh, so in, in economics terms this is called a Leontief or zero substitution. Well, that's the problem. I mean, the, but we know that that's true, not true in the aggregate. That's true plant wise. Plant wise, it is true. Something exactly. I think, uh, exactly. in the micro class, the PhD student that is unfortunately very rarely used in macro, but that's another story again. A lot of other stories coming up. Uh, yeah. And that's why uh, the level of disaggregation of your model or the probability distribution that you have, you might have probably, do you have frequency distribution and parameters uh, for each sector? I don't know how this model that uh, this kind of input output model you use. I know what I use. I don't know the stuff. No, so we, ju we just have um, one sort of uh, representative producer in each sector. Um, and then there's some. And how many sectors do you have? 30. Um, so, so 30. No, no, I understand the difficulty, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. going farther than that, but 30 is pretty aggregate. I mean, I'm not complaining. I know. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. Uh, it. That's right. But but in particular, we have the ones that people think are important. So, you know, chemicals in particular um, and, and so on. Um, but um, no, that's exactly right. So, so, so again, our argument or one of the main arguments is that it's crazy to assume that substitutability is zero. Okay. And that there you think there's some substitutability exactly in particular at the aggregate um, sectoral level. So while it may be true that for individual production processes, there is no substitution, um, you know, that the, there's one way that uh, the chemicals industry um, um, makes makes this plastic and, you know, you cannot really change that so, so easily. Um, at least with some time, um, you'd figure out other ways of doing this. And then there would be some production processes that are too reliant on gas and therefore that would become very expensive or would just not have the input. And then, you know, with the market uh, forces, um, there would be substitution where these production processes would be replaced by other production processes that use, for example, um, you know, uh, uh, some renewable energy source uh, to, to, to make the same product. Or the other type of substitution that's actually also very important um, in our model is uh, substitution via imports, okay? So there's the, uh, uh, the example you hear quite often in the German debate is, okay, um, gas is used uh, to uh, produce ammoniac. I don't know what the English word is. Um, ammoniac. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Ammoniac. I so think it's ammonia. No, I don't know how the actual the English word is. Perfect. Uh, We're both in trouble. Um, <laughs> and then but that, the audience are listening, so he's talking about ammoniac. That's it. Um, and so then the idea is that ammoniac is used to... Uh, um, ammonia, so we have right? people yeah. that know the English language that's, better than you and I. That, thank you. That ammonia is used in fertilizer production. Okay. Um, and then the, the, the argument, you know, some people are making is, well, um, if, if we don't have the gas anymore, um, the, uh, the fertilizer industry would be in trouble and, uh, you know, would, would have to close down. And then that would be horrible for all sorts of things to, to which we say, okay, yes, you're right. That would be horrible for the uh, fertilizer industry. But you know we can imp uh, we can import the fertilizer, um, and it's not the end of you know. The doesn't problem is that now we're gonna get soon to the other part. Sure, we can import the fertilizer, but the guys in Germany that are producing that are gonna yes. go broke. That's right, and they're that's gonna right. hate you. That that's right. Um, no, and and you know again, no one ever said that three percent of GDP is nothing. And obviously, if you you can convert that into jobs. That's a substantial number of jobs. Um, that, that's right. But it's not, you know, mass unemployment. Um, no, no, so the it's not is the end of the world. So that's certainly yeah. one point of your paper that even if you're off by, say, 50 percent, even 4.5 percent is not the end right. of the, the world. Right. Italy suffered an 8 percent, 9 percent drop in GMP due to the first COVID impact. And... Yeah. It was not good. Nobody was happy about it, uh, but it was something that people could, in some sense, survive. Some yeah. suffer more than others. That's actually the big problem, and we'll get to that in a moment, uh, Ben. But in any it's economic right. crisis, it's like that, right? Um, I know. I know. It's just that people have a different... I mean, people tend to have a bad reaction to economic crisis in general. This one, uh, and the COVID as well, 
uh, to the extent that they are mostly the consequence of a political choice yeah. and in political decision, people, ideology and in personal yeah. interests play a big role, obviously creates a stronger reaction, right? I mean, no, that's right. And that, I mean, that and that comes back to what I said earlier about this being a political choice. Um, and, you know, we can only tell you what the cost would be. Um, and I mean, I'm totally sympathetic if the politicians say in the end, look like um, we, we cannot you sell this to our electorate, um, um, yeah. even if it's just a 1% GDP loss, um, it, given it's sort of self-imposed, we cannot do this. On the other hand, I mean, the other reason, by the way, why we wrote our paper um, is not just to think about a self-imposed um, import stop, right? But it's also very possible that uh, Putin's going to say, okay, I want to sow some chaos and I'm going to just shut off the gas taps. Um, and we wanted to have an assessment. Well, he's clearly considering that, right? The, the, right. the games he's playing on the ruble payment are clearly testing exactly. uh, that uh, that willingness and some of the threats about the, the countries that don't like us will not get the yeah. agricultural product, will not get this, will not get that. That's a, So yeah. that's actually a use of your research, which is in case we don't decide to do it, but he decides to do it, maybe temporarily as a threat, how do you react, right? Exactly. Exactly. Before going to the <clears throat> to the social and fiscal aspect, uh, do you guys plan, uh, given that you got the technology uh, set up and the model, uh, do you have any plan to try to extend it to the only you go blank? Yeah. We actually have done this. Um, oh, you've done it? A, Where can I find yeah. it? I, I haven't noticed it. No, no, it's not in our paper. So we wrote, so David uh, Bakai and I, we wrote, um, uh, yeah, it's not on the paper's website yet. And we wrote a paper. Yeah, yeah I'm just advertising the paper uh, first. Yeah. Uh, we wrote right. a paper um, with or for the French Council of Economic Advisors. Um, so there's a, a good economist called Philippe Martin, who who is the head of the. Uh huh. With Philippe Martin. So is that yeah. available somewhere? Do you have some uh, data? There yeah, can I can. I can pull. I can put it in the chat. I guess. Um, you could, sure. Find. You know how to put it in the chat, right? I, I think so. That's. Uh, I don't know if you're um, familiar with Streamia. We didn't have time to talk about. So. Yeah. But um, wait. Um, where in the in this paper we exactly use the model to um, do okay this like this no? Does this work? Um, yep, I got it. Okay. Um, so there we simulated exactly um, an EU-wide um, import stop of, uh, uh, of of Russian energy inputs. And uh, and and we get some, you know, very interesting and, and uh, uh, hardly concerning numbers um, about different countries in the European Union. I don't remember. Okay, this I was not actually not even aware. So it's, I'm just learning. So what's the bottom? So here it is. Let me show better. Oh damn it! Uh, no, sorry, I got confused. Too many windows. All right, uh, here it is. Um, this is a more recent paper that addresses, tries to carry out the same exercise for the all of the EU. EU. Yeah. As yeah. you see, there's different orders that uh, uh, two are in common with uh, the other paper, and then the two are two French colleagues, Philippe Martin and Camille Landet. Uh, all right, here is the bottom line. Do you want to go through and tell uh, our listener? Yeah, roughly. So, so yeah. Given this is for the French Council of Economic Advisors, we mostly uh, focus on France, and well, France you know, notoriously is the most protected. They got the good, nice nuclear plants that I like so much. Exactly, exactly. So, so France is much less reliant, in particular, on gas. Um, so we get much smaller numbers um, for the GDP losses, right? So you can see here in the abstract. Uh, as again, the German numbers for comparison, which were the numbers from the other papers, so 0.3% or 0.5% up to 3% um, in the pessimistic scenario, whereas for France, it's much, much better. Um, there's a nice graph in the end of the paper, if you go down a bit, and um, that shows the results for different EU countries. Um, uh, further? Yeah, further, further, further. Um, still further. <laughs> um, no, here I'm at the end. Oh, really? No, but then is it not in there? Okay, maybe I think it looks like a short paper. This is 14 pages. Yeah. We used and to have a sort of a graph, maybe it got taken out in the end, that has like the 
different, um, you know, like a bar chart with the GDP losses for different countries. I Let's see if I find it. Okay. Maybe not. Yeah, but here it is. Here there you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. That's the one I meant. Okay. So let's see. This is Lithuania. Bulgaria. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So and just to, just to just to qualify this, this is a more pessimistic uh, uh, calculation, which maybe you know you shouldn't interpret as like an immediate cold turkey because it assumes in particular um, a fair bit of substitution through trade, and I guess the view could be that it takes some time to tr form these trade balance, uh, these trade relationships, right? Um, but yeah, so here, essentially, you have all EU countries. Um, and you can see that for for Germany, it's somewhere there in the middle. So it's DEU. Um, you have like so uh, there are different, uh, there are two graphs for different parameterization, yeah. different hypotheses, right? Yes. Parameterization, the bars, you call yeah. it, well, the basic par parametric model. Yeah. Très faible so, elasticité. So like very uh, low elasticity. Yeah. So very low, low. substitute. Yeah. So one should probably in economics we use a concept. Let me tell some of the people that you know, if you reduce the input of something, you can do a little bit of technological change or a lot of technological change, or a lot of changing plants and firms, and you substitute that input with something else. That's what uh, they mean with that. And then there is the full embargo and then tariffs on import yeah. of 40%. So exactly. So in that, in that paper, we also um, did a simulation of what happens if instead of doing a full embargo, we do a tariff on Russian uh, energy inputs. Um, and so, yeah, let me just briefly summarize. Like, let's just look at the, the bottom graph. That's kind yeah. of a good one to look at. Um, so, yeah. Th so the main thing you find is that um, uh, the the losses for different countries are quite heterogeneous you can see italy there is actually right next to germany italy is right next to germany that's yeah. actually uh, fits with me because one of the things i said i don't remember if i was mentioning to you or others that in spite of uh, all the talk the two economies have relatively similar structure at least at the manufacturing industrial level it's just somewhat slightly different weights you got a bit more manufacturing we're not that far away All right so in, in germany it's like i actually looked this up uh, uh just today in germany it's like 25 percent of uh, employment is in manufacturing do you know how much it is in Italy? right i yeah. think it's about 21 22 percent okay okay i think we are in fact notoriously we are the second and close to you manufacturing country in the in, yeah. in the union okay. so i mean that's another thing that's the important problem, the difference is probably we have a bit more agriculture and tourism uh, yeah. that you have and you have more advanced uh, services that we yeah. do but uh, yeah. other than that yeah i mean by the way i mean this is now a little bit of a detour but that's the other thing to keep in mind why you know these these numbers cannot possibly be so large um you know only say you know or not only but let me, let me tell some people didn't understand so okay this lo dico in italiano uh il grafico uh che è importante, è, hanno fatto lo stesso esercizio con lo stesso tipo di modello adattato ai vari paesi, assumendo che tutti i paesi dell'Unione Europea fanno questa operazione di tagliare sull'import del gas russo. In varie maniere, hanno quattro scenari diversi, però questo è quello principale, quello con la barra blu. Allora cosa c'è qui? Sulle ascisse ci sono i paesi dell'Unione Europea, c'è la media a destra, e poi vedete ci sono i paesi ordinati in termini di impatto negativo. Allora, Lituania è la prima, è quella con l'impatto peggiore, e il Lussemburgo è l'ultimo, che addirittura vedrebbe un aumento della, del, della reven, la revenue nationale, uh, questo è il national income, perché il, questo paper è stato fatto per una, è stato commissionato dal governo francese, quindi la versione ha, ha un misto di... Uh, <ride> Uh, English and, and French words and German words, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the international just makes it up. The, anyhow, revenue national in Italian is national income. It's not GMP. This is uh, this is net of, of depreciation, right? If I understand it correctly. Uh, yeah, that's right. And it's also um, netting out uh, uh, net exports, um, I think. Right, 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 yeah. right. Equin, it's the stuff that stays home and affects what you do at home, basically. Yes, yeah. Or um, one way, another way to think about it is like total um, expenditure of right um, of all that at home. Yeah. Right. Yes. 
è, è quello che vedete misurato in punti percentuali di se volete pensare a PIL pensate a PIL però è PIL me, meno l'export netto è la riduzione quindi la riduzione è maggiore che loro stimano di circa il 6% per la Lituania che come sapete è molto pronta a farlo infatti praticamente sono già mossi e l'Italia è qua e stavamo osservando che i paesi maggiori sono qua e non è sorprendente perché hanno strutture industriali in realtà simili Italia, Germania, Spagna, Francia la Francia fra i grandi quella con l'impatto minore perché la Francia uh, avendo energia nucleare è molto più coperta back to English right so yeah right. so the, so the um, other thing you can see here so first of all um, Again, these are the sort of the more optimistic numbers and um, the, the, there's like sort of more pessimistic numbers, um, you know, where, for example, the German GDP loss is a lot more than the one for France, um, which which is not in this figure. But the main thing that we wanted to communicate there is, is two things. So the first thing is you, if you do a full embargo, there's very large differences across countries in the GDP or, or I guess gross national expenditure or income loss here. Um, so the economic damage. In particular, there's these countries that are close to Russia and are close trading partners with Russia. So like Lithuania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, um, and Czech Republic that would have uh, very large um, potentially uh, uh, you know, um, income losses. Um, whereas in these other countries, it's, it's uh, more. So it, uh, how is that that Denmark, Ireland and Luxembourg would be even better off? What are they going to do? They're going to... I yeah I I don't I don't remember this to be honest sorry <laughs> yeah yeah no I I, I I've been wondering I mean, the small this. number no, it just made me curious I saw the uh, positive number yeah. I said, what's going on in Luxembourg they get some uh, new yeah. business from I mean like yeah look like I mean the these calculations here for all countries should be taken with a little bit more of a grain of salt than the calculations just for Germany and France because for Germany and France we really got into the weeds and you know thought hard about whether all the numbers make a lot of sense. Um, for the, all the other countries, yeah, I wouldn't now pick one country on that graph and say, you know, that's the number. Um, right. You know, in, in, in that case, uh, we, we would need to be a bit more careful and do more work. The main point here was just that there's this big heterogeneity potentially. And the other point was that if you, instead of doing a full embargo, you, you do a tariff, um, that's actually much better in terms of having less heterogeneity. So you... Uh, So you reduce the heterogeneity, which maybe for political reasons is, uh, is, is, is an easier sell. So, you know, for, for Lithuania and, and Slovakia, say, um, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's easier. To well, even if, and then we'll move on to the last thing, the observation here that one of our listeners make is, uh, is, the, is the key point, right? The key point in the exercise is say, yes, there's going to be a cost, there's going to be a loss, and yeah. for some countries it's substantial. You know, your GMP that goes down of another 6% mm -hmm. after COVID, It's not exactly peanuts or even 1% or 2% or 3% in Germany, Italy, uh, in the worst scenario. But it's not the Great Depression. It's not the exactly. end of the war. It's not oh, exactly. mass, uh, mass starvation and the disaster yeah. that as those that follow my a small uh, you know, uh, comment on the press every morning at, at 6.37 know, some of the Italian, especially yeah. right wing, but not only, also very left wing newspaper keep portraying oh this is the end of the war if we keep doing yeah. it this is a it's just not there it's yeah. it's a price and then you yeah. make your, your ethical choice yeah. one thing let well, me that's ask. Exactly right like if you want to have one main takeaway from the paper that's that's it um and that's the reason what do, why you, do you guys have looked at what it would be the fiscal policies uh, that could attenuate the impact on those people and sectors and enterprises that would be mostly affected by this and then then i'll let you go because i yeah. promise we'll be done by eight That's fine. We can go a bit no over. Um, but um, so, so yes, we we looked at that. We didn't uh, look at that within the model, so we didn't use the model to do these uh, policies. But we have a discussion in the paper. You know what type of policies uh, you would want to use, and I guess we and and also I guess we we wrote some further follow up things and the. Analogy we use very heavily is uh, the one of the COVID crisis, um, because we do think, I mean, while the shock is in a sense very different, in particular, it's a shock that hits industry very heavily, um, uh, whereas the COVID shock was a shock that hit uh, services much more heavily, right, you know, hospitality and so on. Um, 
it's similar in the sense that there's very large heterogeneity across sectors in the economy. Some sectors probably won't be affected very much and some others will be affected a lot. Um, and then uh, also the people working in these sectors obviously would be affected a lot. So um, we think it's sort of similar in that sense that it's just sort of a very asymmetric um, um, shock in a sense. I, so, I agree. This is something, in fact, that characterized the COVID. They're both supply shocks that there's yes, nothing in exactly. demand here. And exactly. they are quite asymmetric in their exactly. at least first impact. Then, you know, part of it, this one, like the other, will travel through prices and therefore yeah. diffuse everywhere. No, but the okay. first impact in terms of income loss and uh, productivity loss yeah. is clearly directly yeah. on yeah. it. But I mean, the other thing I wanted to say before, so let me just briefly make yep, that one reason, one way you can see that it cannot possibly be the Great Depression is, you know, total industrial employment, we talked about it um, before, is, you know, 25% of total employment. 75% uh, of people instead work elsewhere, in particular in services. Um, that, by the way, is very, very different from what the economy was like in the 1970s when we had the oil price shock, um, where it was much, much more uh, industry. Um, and so, you know, if you have this shock, so everyone is always com concerned about you know, what's going to happen to industry, in particular, so some very specific industries. But these are just not that large. If you think about, I mean, they're large. I mean, 25% is obviously massive. Also, if you look at production, they're large, but they're not like the entire economy, essentially. And they're much less than what they used to be in the 70s. And so that also how we square that, you know, this shock we think would be much less bad than the oil price shock in the 70s. Also, the policy was screwed up in the 70s so that that was also another issue i think um, but well yeah. policy may screw, be screwed up now let me raise my hands on that I, you know, <laughs> we <laughs> this actually could be an interesting topic of discussion if you like we may have different opinion on that one i believe we've been screwing up policies on covid uh quite substantially for the last uh more than two years actually pre-covid so but but, that, but that's neither here nor there it's okay um Right. Well, so that's that's the point. Uh, are you going to continue following in this? Are we going to be uh, listening to you in the future? So, so I guess uh, yes and no. I mean, I, it's a it's it's an issue that's uh, close to my heart. I'm presenting tomorrow uh, the, the proper paper, like a proper uh, paper presentation. There's something called Marcus Academy. Um, uh, Marcus Brunemeyer at Princeton has a nice sort of online workshop. So, if if you want to see, you know, proper slides. Uh, uh, and the proper presentation, then tune into that. That's going to be, I think, live streamed on YouTube or at least available on YouTube afterwards. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, we're we're gonna sort of, you know, keep keep going around and uh, and and you know, spreading our results. And I guess the other thing we are kind of doing, mostly behind closed doors, is just uh, thinking about like, okay, look, like maybe even either we want either we end up doing this. Sort of in particular, I guess what's on the table now is an oil or coal embargo. Um, or as I said before, maybe Putin's going to sort of just, you know, sh shut off the, uh, the gas taps um, himself. And then I guess, yeah, given we've thought about this a bit um, at this point. Or a right. Lot now, that's why I was suggesting that there are other scenarios and other uh, yeah. side of the thing. Yeah. That, yeah. No. So, so we're going to, you know, at least um, sort of try uh, telling people what the right policies are to do. In particular, one thing you don't want to do too much of um, uh, is subsidize energy prices, in particular um, oil and uh, gas prices, because you actually want these prices. Have you to sent your paper to the Spanish government? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Of you course, know what I mean, right? <laughs> every politician's uh, instinct is to do exactly the opposite, right? So you wanna, you want these prices. Ascoltate bene questa, non si non si danno i sussidi per pagare la benzina piuttosto si lascia che il prezzo della benzina gasolio eh, vada su e poi si danno i sussidi a quelli che perdono il lavoro a causa di quello ma si permetta che il meccanismo funzioni yeah, Sorry, exactly. it was a, a main, you important point that I also make often and I wanted to repeat it yeah, you want people to, to substitute away right? if you want to substitute if you want to subsidize something um, you should subsidize the alternative energy sources not the oil um, I mean, like I mean, nuclear I mean, if you want to. <laughs> That's right. Yes, uh, I'm yeah. one of those. Right. <laughs> that's um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. Um.
That's the point. So I think we are being very grateful to Ben for taking his time. And uh, now he's discovered a new audience in Italy. This is going to be listened by you spam it. Okay, guys, um, a few tens of thousands. Uh, we'll see how many. Uh, and um, if there is a chance uh, in the future, maybe to talk about the policies, the macro policy, I will get to call you. Uh, maybe we'll get Paco. And so we'll get a three dimensional yeah. view. There you go. That'd be great. There you go. Yeah, so All right. right. Thanks. All right. Thanks Thank very you, much. Thanks Take for care. listening, everyone. Thanks for dropping by. Take care. Bye bye. bye. <clears throat>